Shandy Campbell and this is the History of Musical Theatre podcast. You might have noticed a little hiatus. I've had some health issues, which has made the scope of this season a little bit untenable for me right at this minute. So I'm going to take a week off, pop this season on hiatus, and then I'm going to be back with a new season all about Les Mis with a slightly smaller scope. I'll keep writing the Tanakul Leclerc years and the rest of this season in the background so that I can bring it back a little less slapdash and hopefully very exciting. Okay, let's get on to Season 3, Episode 7, 1946. I want to do a couple of reintroductions. This season has involved so many characters, involved across so many companies and countries, that it can be a little bit difficult to keep track of everyone. Firstly, Alyssa Alonso. We met her in Cuba, where she trained, got married, and had a baby, and then moved to the States with her husband. There they performed on Broadway, and then began dancing at Ballet Theatre. She was an exceptional dancer, but what really established her legendary status began in 1941. She started having vision problems, and when she went to the doctor, it was discovered that she had a detached retina. Generally speaking, and I'm not a doctor, I've heard that retina tends to work better if it's, if it's attached. That's why they normally come like that. She had surgery and then three months of bed rest. During that time, she would point and flex her feet to try and keep some degree of mobility and strength in her legs. The initial surgery was not completely successful. She'd lost almost all of her peripheral vision. She had a second surgery, followed by a third surgery. And during this time, she had a full year of bed rest. During this time, her husband, a fellow dancer, taught her the role of Giselle by dancing it on her hands. With his hands, obviously, not with his feet, otherwise that would necessitate more surgery and then more rest, and then he'd try and teach her another role and break her hands again, and then she'd need more surgery and more rest, and it would just go on and on for it. He danced it with his hands. (laughs) Eventually she returned to dancing because he didn't dance on her hands with his feet. See? They're smart. With a particularly triumphant run in ballet theatre's Giselle, Alicia Markova, a British ballerina who took on a Russian-sounding surname during her time with the Ballet Russe, was originally slated to perform the role. But then she was suddenly injured, and Alyssa Alonso went on in her place. The thing is that by this time, Alyssa Alonso was almost completely blind. A string was hung across the front of the stage at waist height, so that if she got too far forward, she'd bump into it and know that she'd reach the front of the stage instead of tumbling dramatically into the orchestra pit, a la Jerry Robbins. There were also some slight lighting changes, with the lights allowing her to use her limited vision to tell stage right from stage left. And her partners were very, very careful to partner her safely within their reach Basically, they made a couple of changes, and still somehow, no one in the audience would have known. I think that is incredible. I struggle to keep, keep my balance, and I have vision. So the fact that Alyssa Alonso could dance Giselle blind is amazing. In 1946, where our episode begins, she was promoted to the rank of principal at Ballet Theatre. A well-deserved title. The second reintroduction I'm going to do now is Barbara Boucher. We met her briefly a few episodes ago when Alexandra Danilova performed a show in Oklahoma, inspiring the young girl to pursue dance. She's going to be a pretty big feature in this episode because her memoir recounts the creation and performance of so many of the ballets performed by the company during these years. Her time in the company was not happy. In her own words, to have begun exercising this period of my early life has not been an easy task, but since every generation breeds new despots like moths to flame, there are always innocents waiting to be scorched. As the floodgates of memory are unlocked, what I had been subjected to was beyond the boundaries of abuse. It had skirted the borders of torture. As such, it would have been a dereliction of duty for me to further ignore it. And that... At the other end of this time capsule, age 77, I cannot and will not do. 
there are echoes of her experience in other memoirs that I'm using for this podcast, including Swan Dive and Broadway Balanchine and Beyond. Certainly, her experience was not unique. Now, to the main story. In 1946, the Ballet Society is founded. It was really just a new business model for the previous company. They now ran on a subscription-only model. They wouldn't sell individual tickets, only a season-wide subscription, which also included some special events and a scholarly publication called Dance Index. And the press wasn't excluded from this policy. If they wanted to review the works, they would have to subscribe like everyone else. This was very in character for Lincoln Kirstein, who wasn't opposed to a little light provocation. The original season had 800 subscribers. One of them, a member of the press who was clearly interested enough to fork out for the season, said the following. The long wait, the uncomfortable seats, were immediately forgotten, for there was magic on stage. The opening performance took place in a high school auditorium, and started very late. The program included L'Enfant et les Sautilèges, a show which included both dancers and singers who doubled roles, as well as the four temperaments. Jerome Robbins created a ballet for simile for ballet theatre. It was another collaboration with his longtime working partners Leonard Bernstein, who wrote the music, and Oliver Smith, who designed the sets. It's a three-hander, with two of those three roles being played by Jerome Robbins and Nora Kay. In 1947, Balanchine spent a little time in Paris. I mean, like a really little bit of time. Two weeks, to be precise, as a guest ballet master for the Paris Opera Ballet. While he was there, he created the ballet Le Palais de Christel. George worked once again with Tamara Tormanova, who danced there, creating the first movement principal role on her. Maria Tallchief would perform that role in New York for the premiere there the following year, so in many ways the role was equally created for her. Each movement of the ballet has a different colour costume. In New York, he created Heif de Vertimento with Mary Ellen Moyen, Tanaquil Leclerc, and Lou Christensen. The ballet had a principal couple and four supporting couples, and as a piece combined some elements of modern dance along with some popular dance into classical ballet. It's not widely performed anymore. Symphony Concertante was created as a teaching ballet. The violin and viola parts in the score, which are the soloists in the music, are used as accompaniment for the two principal female parts. Those principal parts were played by Maria and Tani, the latter of whom was 16 at the time. She was a pure product of SAB, described as tall, thin, elegant, witty, with a big jump and a sardonic grin. Whereas Maria was a powerhouse, Tani was a greyhound. He also created the duo of ballets The Medium and The Telephone, which appeared on Broadway. Of the New York works, Probably the most enduring was Theme and Variations. Theme and Variations was choreographed to music by Tchaikovsky. It used as a regular theme a polonaise, which is a Polish style of music and dance. It's in 3-4 time. If you look up a polonaise step, you'll get a better sense of the choreography. This step is used as a staple in this ballet, repeating it in increasingly complex patterns with other small jumps and turns peppered in. It was one of the most... Petit Pain of Mr. B's works. It actually wasn't created for the New York City Ballet, but rather for ballet theatre. It wouldn't come to Balanchine's own company until the 60s. Alyssa Alonso danced the principal female role, one of the most difficult ballerina roles he ever created. The cavalier, or the male principal role, is also extremely difficult. A normal solo has some linking steps, a pas de bourre here, a chasse there quarter of a second for you to catch your breath. Not here. The whole thing is jumps with a double rond de jambe en l'air and grand tours and the whole shebang. It's a really virtuosic piece. The ballet ends with the entire company of dancers in unison. Throughout the 80s, it was actually the only Balanchine work at Ballet Theatre, or American Ballet Theatre as it would then be called. On Broadway, the musical Finian's Rainbow opened, with choreography by Michael Kidd. Lock that one away, we'll talk about it in a couple of episodes. Another significant dance musical that year was Brigadoon, 
It had music by Frederick Lowe, lyrics by Alan J. Lerner, and choreography by Agnes DeMille. Lerner and Lowe are like a fractionally less well-known Rodgers and Hammerstein. They also wrote Camelot, Gigi, and My Fair Lady. Lerner also wrote The Musical Theatre A Celebration, which is a history of musical theatre. It's a great book. Agnes DeMille is well known for using ballet and folk dance as part of her Broadway choreography. Agnes DeMille also choreographed a second Broadway show this year, Allegro, this one written by Rodgers and Hammerstein, who were like a fractionally more known Lerner and Lowe. This production included in the company Susan Svetlik. You've probably never heard of her because historically she's not a huge deal. I'm really sorry to all the Susan Svetlik stands out there, but she ties some story details together. William Dollar choreographed Andrew Chernier, which performed a single show on Broadway. Robbins worked on the Broadway show High Button Shoes, for which he won a Tony Award for his choreography. It was directed by George Abbott, another longtime collaborator of Jerome Robbins. 1948. I remember being confused when I saw a clip from the Paris Opera of a Balanchine ballet called Le Palais de Cristal. And when I went to look for it on the Balanchine Trust website, a thing that I just used to do and still do, I couldn't find it. It turns out it had had a name change and also a costume change for its New York production. Renamed Symphony in C, with new black and white costumes, the ballet was a massive success and has become a real mainstay of the company for years to come. Another Balanchine work from this year was Pas de Trois, with music by Leon Minkus. Minkus was a composer who wrote a lot of ballet music which Petit Pas used. Best known of these are Paquita and Don Quixote. Pas de Trois was almost a complete staging of a part of Trois from Paquita, with a couple of change steps. Paquita seems to be the place Balanchine chose to steal from the most. A significant work this year was Orpheus. Like, really significant. It was another Balanchine-Stravinsky collaboration, based on the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Tallchief played the role of Eurydice, and Leclerc was the leader of the Bacchanals. Bacchanantes. The Bacchanatales who tear Orpheus to pieces. There's a slight dramatic irony that wife and future wife dance these respective roles. The great significance of this work came in the viewing. A program, including this work, led Morton Baum to offer the Ballet Society to become a permanent company at the City Centre of Music and Drama. With a new home, they changed the name and the model of the company. Ballet Society became the New York City Ballet, and the subscription model was dropped in favour of a more conventional single ticket model. Their first program included Orpheus, Concerto Barocco, and Symphony in C. The 30-year-old Jerome Robbins was in the audience, where he found himself in awe of Mr. B's work. He wrote to Balanchine saying, I'd like to work with you. The reply? Come on. He took a pay cut as a choreographer, but was going to be given the chance to dance Balanchine's choreography. He was not a great dancer, with his late and haphazard training precluding the acquisition of any technique. Robbins wasn't the only ballet theatre member pulled over to the new New York City Ballet. Also included was Melissa Hayden, Diana Adams, Hugh Lang, Janet Reed, and Nora Kay. I'd like to take a minute to reintroduce someone. We met Nora Kay, or... Nora Koroff, as she was born, in our last season. She was part of the Jerome Robbins contingent. In spite of her Eastern European surname, she was a tough, no-nonsense girl from Brooklyn with a nasal New York accent you could slice with a knife. I stole that line from Barbara Boucher. She was named after the protagonist of the highly controversial Ibsen play The Doll's House about a woman who leaves her husband and children. There's obviously more that happens in that play, but the ending was the really controversial bit. Nora Kay began her training at eight with the Met Opera Ballet School, and at 15, she joined the Corps de Ballet there. She was not satisfied with the work there. Understandable, Balanchine did say that the tradition of ballet at the Met was just bad ballet. And she branched out into work on Broadway. She made her Broadway debut in 1935 in The Land of Bells, a musical which ran the impressive length of four days. Bit of a flop. In 1937, she returned to musical theatre in the show of Virginia, 
and in 1938 in The Great Lady. It was an unmitigated flop. Again, she's not had the best success on Broadway. But for Nora Kay, it introduced her to fellow cast member Jerome Robbins and to the choreographer William Dollar. During this time, she'd also furthered her dance training. The technical standards of dancing in contemporary dance companies are crazy high, but there's still some differences between companies. And that was also the case in the 30s and 40s. Nora Kay's further training was with Mikhail Fokin and at SAB. All of this training paid off in 1939 when she performed on Broadway in Stars in Your Eyes alongside Alicia and Ferdinand Alonso, Jerome Robbins and bona fide Broadway diva Ethel Merman. It was also the year Ballet Theatre was founded, which she joined as part of its first company of dancers. At this company, she danced in Balanchine's Waltz Academy, as well as making a name for herself in Anthony Tudor's gala performance. Ballet Theatre had two runs on Broadway during this time, in which Nora Kay also performed. In spite of her additional training and her strong dramatic skills, she was not well suited to the Balanchine repertoire she was given once she joined the NYCB. It was the repertoire from other choreographers like Anthony Tudor and Jerome Robbins where she really shone. Another interesting thing of note about Nora Kay was her collection of engagements and marriages to men who were clearly gay. The list included Arthur Lawrence, Jerome Robbins, Kenneth Macmillan, and Frederick Ashton, according to Barbara Boche. Agnes DeMille had a new ballet this year, one of her most successful, Fall River Legend, based on the story of Lizzie Borden. Alicia Alonso danced the principal role for most of the run, although not on opening night because of an injury. Following this, Alicia Alonso would leave the States to found the Alicia Alonso Ballet Company in her hometown of Havana. On Broadway, the ballet double bill of The Telephone and The Medium was presented once again. In Hollywood, the film Words and Music was made. The title doesn't really give you a sense of the project itself. It's a fictionalised version of the collaboration between Richard Rogers and Lorenz Hart, played by Mickey Rooney and Tom Drake, respectively. The pair of them had worked a number of times with George Balanchine. The film also featured a lot of big-name stars, mainly playing themselves. That list included Gene Kelly, Judy Garland, Vera Ellen, and June Allison. You might not know that last one, but she's actually my mother's namesake, particularly loved by my grandmother for playing Joe March in Little Women. Sid Charisse, who'd go on to be the girl in the green dress from Singing in the Rain, was also in this film, but not playing herself. <laughs> marked the official opening of the New York City Ballet at City Centre. It took them a few days into the year to open, on the 18th as opposed to SAB, which opened on the 2nd of its respective year. City Centre was actually a disused former Freemasons temple, which, you know, for tax reasons, came into the possession of the city of New York, and they didn't really have a use for it, until Kirstein asked them to rent it to the new company, so they had a home. Their first season would run at a $47,000 deficit, and I mean $47,000 in 1949 money, which I have checked and accounting for inflation is actually $4 bajillion and your right kidney. Kirsten paid it. In June, 14-year-old Barbara Boucher came to New York to audition for the School of American Ballet. She had seen Alexandra Danilova perform at the Ballet Russe years prior, which inspired her to become a dancer. She'd been taking classes once a week in ballet, Spanish dance, hula, tap dance, and diction. Not a bad collection, but her teacher got to the point where she felt like she didn't have any more she could teach. So, on to other training. She wrote to Danilva, who wrote back suggesting she audition for the summer program at SAB. She attended the audition, which was run by Muriel Stewart. She didn't actually see Alexandra Danilova there, but she was accepted into the summer program. In one particular class, Stuart gave an extremely difficult combination across the floor, featuring a lot of turns. To delay the inevitable, Barbara went to re-rosin her point shoes. Muriel's response? <sighs> Darling, 
All the rosin in the world won't save you now. She couldn't have done too badly, though, because by the end of the summer, she'd moved up to the top grade in the summer program and be given a scholarship for the autumn semester, both of which were at the hand of Balanchine himself. The SAB curriculum at the time involved modern dance taught by Merce Cunningham, character dance with Jurek Lavovsky, point and variations with Filia Dubrovsky, Dubrovska, apologies, and Adagio with Pierre Vladimirov and Anatole Obukov. Merce's class was accompanied on the piano by his partner, John Cage. Yes, that John Cage. Although I don't believe he just sat in silence. I think he actually played the piano. Barbara's own assessment of the class was not particularly favourable. She found it to be sterile, meaningless, and sleep-inducing, and called the movement ungainly and aesthetically indigestible. Oof. By contrast, Yurik's character class was always an exhilarating tonic. Point and Variations class with Filia Dubrovska involved learning repertoire from the great Russian ballets, and always ended with 32 fuetes on point. You've got to keep something in the tank for that. Dubrovska's hu- husband and former Kisinska partner Pierre Vladimirov alternated teaching Adagio with Anatole Obukov. The class was called Adagio, but is more similar to what we would call a part de deux class or a partnering class. Like Filia's class, they taught repertoire from the famous Russian ballets, but rather than solo variations, they taught partnering sections. All of this was in addition to her regular ballet classes. If all of that doesn't seem like an exhausting enough schedule as is, Barbara also did high school by correspondence with professional children's school and somehow found the time to sneak into an occasional class at Ballet Arts, the feeder school for ballet theatre. They weren't really meant to do this because the two schools were really competitors, but many of them did. In one particular class, Boucher danced the Black Swan Pas de Deux to great acclaim. Well, as much acclaim as you can get in a classroom. Agnes de Mille watched from the doorway and would later gift Barbara an inscribed copy of her memoir. Barbara would never have the opportunity to perform this Pas de Deux on stage, but holds that class as one of her proudest memories. In October, Balanchine saw Barbara in class at SAB, obviously, and invited her to join the company. She was the youngest in the company at the age of 14. Jacques Damois is also invited to join the company this year at the ripe old age of 15. Class was a little different in the company than in the school. When Balanchine taught class, it was full of experimentation. Women did the centre portion on point, in their point shoes, and this continued on into the future. Catherine Morgan said that during her time at SAB in the upper levels, she doesn't remember if she even owned a pair of flat ballet shoes. The season included Lou Christensen's Jinx, Todd Belender's Mother's Goose Suite, alongside a host of Balanchine works. These included Symphony in C, Symphony Concertante, Orpheus, and Serenade. His new works for this season were Bure Fantasque and Firebird, both of which have costume stories attached to them. Bure Fantasque had the costumes arrive minutes before the curtain on their premiere, but the ballet with its happy and carefree vibrations bathed the audience in sheer delight. The costume drama was not a disaster. The idea for Firebird came from the impresario Sol Hurok, who'd managed Anna Pavlova, Isadora Duncan, and the Ballet Russe. He suggested to Balanchine that he buy the costumes off of him, from the original Fokin production of Firebird, designed and painted by Marc Chagnal, and then create his own version of the ballet for his wife, Maria Tallchief. Those costumes have actually stuck around at the company for a long time. Current company member Georgina Pazkogun writing in the next century, described wearing them as putting on what was essentially a well-worn, sweat-soaked, masterfully painted comforter, albeit beautifully painted by Chagnal, felt like ritual hazing. Not important to the story, but in Australia, we call comforters dunas. I, I don't know why, but we do. Opening night 
had 14 curtain calls and really put both Maria Tallchief and the New York City Ballet on the map. Lincoln Kirstein even managed a smile, an unusual occurrence since he never seemed to alter his dour expression of intense preoccupation. So, you know, a big deal. Other choreographers also created works for the company. Jerome Robbins created The Guests, which included Melissa Hayden, Nora Kay, Tanaquil Leclerc, and Robbins himself. William Dollar choreographed Undine for the company to Vivaldi's seasons. He was also the only outside choreographer to be part of Roland Petit's Ballet de Paris, a series of dancers from Paris performing choreography by Roland Petit. See? The name makes sense. Dollar's Le Combat was performed alongside Petit's Cameron, Luf à la Coque et Pas d'Action. They performed this season on Broadway, and Roland Petit himself danced in Carmen and in Pas d'Action. Another New York ballet event was a, an English ballet tour which brought Alyssa Markova to the States. She performed in Giselle, Fokine's Le Selfides, and Anton Dolan's Pas de Quatre. Many members of the New York City Ballet attended these performances. 1950 was another big year for the New York City Ballet. Balanchine himself created a small new work, Sylvia Partido, created on his wife Tallchief. He also revived Prodigal Son, playing the father himself, with Mary Tallchief and later Yvonne Munsi as the siren and Jerome Robbins as the son. That's pretty high up on my time travel show list. Speaking of Robbins, he created another new work for the company, Age of Anxiety, which was another Leonard Bernstein collaboration. He danced in it himself alongside Tanny, Yvonne Munsey, Patricia McBride, and Melissa Hayden. Outside choreographers were also brought in to work with the company. William Dollar's Le Combat, now retitled The Jewel, was brought to the company with an expanded court of ballet. Jacques Dembois, Nora Kay, and Melissa Hayden danced the principal parts. Melissa had only actually started dancing at 16, but she had a ferocious and unremitting drive and was no slouch in the Stand Up For Yourself department. She was able to make up for years of training with this remarkable grit. The duel wasn't Nora Kay's only success that year. Anthony Tudor's ballet, Lilac Garden, was brought to the company as a vehicle for her. The whole company was thrilled for her, so thrilled that someone left her a beautifully gift-wrapped dead snake. Yikes. The successes weren't limited to New York or even to America. They had a five-week stay at the Royal Opera House in London. British choreographer Frederick Ashton created the new ballet Illuminations on the company. It was first premiered in New York. It took as its subject matter the life and works of the poet Arthur Rimbold. He was a fire that burned bright and fast. At 16, he'd written acclaimed works, only to leave for the African wilderness and die at 37 with no further literary contributions. On reflection, Barbara Boucher felt that she could compare her own life to this. It was a very provocative ballet. It was an era of choreographers pushing boundaries. Melissa Hayden danced the role of profane love in One Point Shoe and One Barefoot. Tanny danced her counterpart as sacred love. The company went to London, and upon arrival, the UK press were obsessed with the company's baby ballerina. Reporters swamped George Balanchine, Maria Tallchief, and Barbara Boucher. In spite of the warm welcome, Barbara found herself with some visa issues. She needed a special work permit as a child, which no one had applied for. The company manager had to call in every favour she had, to get the permit for Boucher to perform. The British Ministry of Labour required that she be given her own dressing room and be appointed an inspector. The point of the private dressing room was so that she could avoid hearing profanity, which was largely undermined by jealous core girls opening the door with the explicit purpose of yelling the exact profanities which the dressing room had been designed to avoid. The inspector had many of the necessary attributes of an excellent wax statue. He sat, looked straight ahead, and never spoke to or interacted with anyone. 
The stage was much, much larger, with a strong rake. A raked stage is one where the back of the stage is higher than the front. It's actually where the terms upstage for the back and downstage for the front come from. It's great for actors and singers, allowing the audience a better view, but it wrecks havoc on dancers. The welcome party for the company in London included Margot Fontaine, Nanette Valois, Alicia Markova, and Arnold Haskell, who wrote the band Ballet Annuals. Back in New York, there were other ballet events. William Dollar created Je to Music by Claude Debussy for Ballet Theatre, and the Sadler's Well Ballet Company, along with their prima ballerina Margot Fontaine, brought Swan Lake to the city. On Broadway, New York City Ballet Company member Harold Lang left the company for the Broadway production of Guys and Dolls. Tamara Jeeva performed in the play Pride's Crossing. The cast of six were all experienced theatre actors, with only three musical theatre credits between the non-Tamara cast. The transformation into serious theatre actress was well and truly complete. I've been unable to find a plot for this play. I'm not subscribed to the New York Times, so I can't actually read the original 1950 review. I was able to find a plot for the 1997 play of the same title, but a different plot, which is about Mabel Tidings Bigelow, who was the first woman to swim the English Channel, so good on her. I also need to make another introduction. Betty Jane Siegel, or Betty Jane, one word, Sills, as she'd later be known. She's the daughter of a singer and a musician. Her father had actually sung in 25 Broadway shows, including The Student Prince and The Desert Song. Primarily, though, he was a double bass player, playing with the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra and the Boston Pops. His own career, however, was a little bit stunted by his own shyness. His wife had none of that shyness, and set about to prepare their daughter, Betty Jane, for the stage. The play The Wisteria Trees, based on Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, was preparing for a run on Broadway when they realised that the little girl they'd cast was six years old and therefore not legally allowed to perform in the show. In their second round of auditions, they found the much more mature seven-year-old Betty Jane. In 1951, Balanchine created A la Francois and his one-act Swan Lake for his wife, Maria Tallchief. Based on that, you'd think that their marriage was going well, but really it depended on who you asked. Mary herself wrote, Work took precedence over everything. Passion and romance didn't play a big role in our married life. We saved our emotion for the classroom. He made sure we slept in twin beds, perhaps to conserve his energy. His affections were shifting a little towards his other muse, Tanaquil Leclerc. He created Lavals on her, a ballet which harkened back to his earlier work on Cotillion. It was also filmed for a short documentary. Barbara Boucher had her first and only Balanchine role created on her in Capriccio Brilliante. Robbins was always creating work on her, much to her chagrin. His new ballet, The Pied Piper, opened with Barbara doing a walkover because she was actually the only one in the company who could do one. The ballet had music by Aaron Copeland and was a jazzy piece which included a Charleston. Tanny and Janet Reed danced the principal roles. The ballet included an onstage clarinetist, the titular piper seated on a stool. At the end of the ballet, a small explosion goes off under the seat and there's a blackout. And then the musician disappears. But as it turned out, it was very difficult to get a musician to agree to sit on a chair with an explosion going on underneath. Very often, they would dive offstage before the explosion. The dancers found this hilarious because they would have sat on the exploding chair. Robin's other work that year was The Cage, which Barbara Boucher took as the title for her memoir. Nora Kay danced The Novice, and Yvonne Monsi danced The Amazon Queen. Barbara had some things to say, both about the ballet, saying, What we were doing on stage was, in my estimation, pornography on point. And about the rehearsal process, saying, Most of the company dancers possess the ability to learn very quickly, to memorise steps as well as the musical score with accuracy after being shown only once. That was thanks to our working with Mr. B. It annoyed Robbins to no end that we were so quick to learn. He would run out of ideas and be void of material halfway through the generous and expansive rehearsal time allotted to him. Nora Kay wasn't a pushover in these rehearsals, saying, you know, Jerry, sometimes you're a shit. 
so much for avoiding profanity. Outside choreographer and former ballet Ruth de Monte Carlo member, Ruth Anna Boris, created the ballet Cakewalk for the company. It called back to Deep South minstrel shows. Janet Reed and Barbara Boucher alternated the principal role. Betty Jane Sills performed in another Broadway show, this time a musical called Seventeen. She wasn't actually originally called back after she pronounced the word dog as dog in her first audition. Her father talked to the producers, though, who agreed to give her another chance. Casting her, as it turned out, was the right choice. Most of the reviews of the show called her out as a highlight. There were two dogs in the show. Balanchine did some additional choreography for a production of Romeo and Juliet, which included Susan Svetlik. I told you I'd bring her up again. I did it. Good on me. In Hollywood, an American in Paris was being made. Balanchine's expensive idea finally got its full-length film, despite him not being involved at all. Gene Kelly choreographed and stars alongside ballerina Leslie Caron. The screenplay was written by Alan J. Lerner of Camelot, Brigadoon, and My Fair Lady fame. It was also the place where Joan Bailey and Ray Weimer met. They would soon marry and stay together forever and ever. Ray Weimer also danced in Rich, Young, and Pretty. Balanchine created three new ballets for the company in 1952. Concertino, Harlequinade Pas de Deux, and Scotch Symphony. Frederick Ashton also created a new ballet on the company. Picnic at Tintagel. The plot centres around a pair of tourists visiting the castle of Tintagel, where they imagine themselves as Tristan and Isolde. Diana Adams and Jacques D'Ambois dance these principal roles. The ballet is unfortunately lost. I'm a bit sad about that because it sounds kind of fun. Muriel Stewart and Lincoln Kirstein collaborated on a book, The Classic Ballet, Technique and Terminology, for which Balanchine wrote a foreword. William Dollar created Four Saints in Three Acts, an opera in four acts. I absolutely love that title. It also features more like 20 saints, so it's a pretty numerically inaccurate title. I love it. In the original, original production, Frederick Ashton had been the choreographer after Balanchine declined. The company went on an extended European tour. Their first stop was Spain, where Swan Lake received 28 Curtain calls? What? The best I've ever gotten for a show was three, and I felt like the absolute bee's knees. The cat's pyjamas. In Paris, a costume for Symphony and C was sent to a cleaner to see if the quality and efficiency was good enough to give them all the costumes for the run. It turns out they weren't, efficiency being their main problem. They'd been given a first movement costume, and it wasn't finished. The solution, when Symphony in C was being performed, was to give a second movement costume to the girl whose costume was missing, and then quick change so that the second movement girl would make it on stage in time. Barbara, fearing that she was going to have to give up her costume, ran and hid in a bathroom. There was a problem. The bathroom door locked on her, trapping her there. She tried to yell for help, but no one heard her. There was a window above the toilet, leading out onto the street five stories up. She kicked the window out of its frame, hearing it smash on the street below. In satin point shoes and fearing certain death, she inched along the outside of the building until she reached the next window along, opening it and making it back inside. A little dusty, she made it on stage in time. The insanity of her actions weren't immediately obvious to her. Such was the pressure to impress Mr. B. In Hollywood, Ray Weimer danced in the film Singing in the Rain. Maria Tallchief asked Mr. B for an annulment. She wanted children. His response was, any woman can be a mother, few can be ballerinas. I'd like to take a moment to point out that women can and have done both. Janet Reed, who we spoke about in this episode, was a mother this whole time, and future New York City ballet ballerina Megan Fairchild is a mother of three. Artistic director, founder, and chief choreographer of Ballet 58, Juliana Rubio Slager, is also a mother. Maria remarried soon after to an airline pilot, who, according to kem- contemporary accounts, was extremely attractive and very in love with her. That marriage actually didn't work out, but her third marriage did. She got there eventually. 
Not to be outdone, on December 31st, George Balanchine married Tanaquil Leclerc. And we are going to leave this story there for a couple of weeks. While I write more, while I write more, we're going to have a brief interlude where we talk about Les Mis and hopefully I'll be able to come back with such a good episode eight of this season where we'll be talking about the years Balanchine was married to Tanaquil Leclerc. I'll be taking next week off. After that, you'll be getting season four, episode one, which is about the source material and the source material for the inspiration of Les Mis. Until then, bye. Thank you.